Ayaraki Mount Cook being the biggest and most complex and highest mountain in the country um, represents one of the more, most interesting with its sort of eight ridges or so, its multiple faces, it's, it's big, it's complex and it's challenging. So it's, it's a special place. Early in uh, November 1991, uh, Brian Whedon and I decided that we were going to do an east face climb and we set off in early December, having planned the trip, uh, climbed the east face in about 10 hours. Seven days later, the whole of the east face fell off and uh, 50 million tonnes of rock roared down into the Tasman Valley, filling it with mud and ice. So we'd actually done the last ascent of the old height of the mountain. In December 1991, uh, a big rock avalanche eventually came down Mount Cook and uh, took the, the, the summit off, really. And by that time, there was a bit of a debate as to how much uh, came down the mountain and how much the, the, the top eventually uh, was reduced by. The figure eventually uh, settled to 10 meters less, uh, making the height of our Aki 3,754 meters. And our model, for some reason, uh, departed from that height uh, by a substantial amount. Um, since the big avalanche, uh, there's been an estimate of the change in height, um, but we're here to determine whether that estimate is correct or not. Uh, so we're presently at Plateau Hut. Um, which is at about 2,200 metres, and this was the first step in our trip to survey Mount Cook. The most important instruments for us are the um, two GPSs, the Trimble R10s. We will use those to survey the top of Mount Cook. This is a University of Otago and GNS funded trip, um, so we've had to be fairly careful about the safety measures. Um, so we've got two guides working with us um, and we're going to use the standard protocol which is one guide per client. So there will be a party of four. As preparation for the climb we um, did some snow safety this afternoon. So if you're roped together and um, you need to have fixed points and anchors, um, you use snow stakes and other things to protect yourself. So we um, ended up waking up at about midnight, other climbers were kind of busy getting ready to go. Um, we did the same and then I think we left the hut at about 1am. So just walking through that darkness, um, you follow just a small train of head torches um, and that's your only kind of reference point um, because it's otherwise completely dark. One thing that did happen to us was that there's a large shrund at the top of the Linda, um, which was basically a big crevasse and it was really difficult to pass through. There was only one little small section that had a bridge, um, but it was almost vertical. Um, but we managed to pass through that and then it was not too far after that time that the sun really started to appear and that moment of brilliance when the sun comes up and suddenly you realise um, how high you are and that sort of vista of the New Zealand landscape suddenly appears um, and it's just a brilliant feeling, it's, it's beautiful. Well there's certainly plenty of ice falls in a um, place like this and so they're probably the uncertainty and so as you pass up through the Linda you have to be fairly careful, there's a particular point where you do pass under some ice cliffs and at that point you really want to just keep moving quite quickly and minimise the risk. We were fairly high, not too far away from the summit rocks and at that point um, we really got into pitching uh, where you really have to belay and move through a rock band that separates you from the summit. It was beautiful conditions and the sun had came out so we kind of warmed ourselves up um, and it was just really enjoyable climbing on some little steep rock bands. Um, a lot of it's quite poor quality so you have to be fairly careful about what you hold because bits are falling off and things and you don't want those rocks to fall on people below you. But there are sections which are actually really nice rock as well. Then the last section to the summit was really straightforward 
and the summit itself has reformed itself and it was quite a nice area to sit down and we could really place the GPS's on the location that we wanted to be. Um, we had some stakes that allowed us to kind of drive um, a pole into the ice and then we set the GPS's on that um, and they're simply pre-programmed so it's really just um, a matter of push and go and then the critical thing there was just to maintain a static survey for us to be there at least 20 minutes. Given the difficulty of climbing Mount Cook, um, to actually get to the summit and do what we were supposed to do, it was a really great feeling. And to take those really unique measurements was an achievement, I think. So of course, when you get to the top, it's only halfway. So the descent is something that you have to be fairly careful with. Um, it was uneventful. The abseils went well. Um, we did that as a party of four with double ropes, um, which allowed us to pass through that section fairly quickly. The snow had softened significantly over the Linda Shelf, so that was quite an easy walk. So the, the, the climb itself was um, a total of just over 18 hours, 10 hours to the top. Um, we probably spent about 45 minutes, almost an hour, at the top doing the measurements and then um, back down. And so I think we were about 18 hours plus when we got back, just over 18 hours. The GPS measurements that we took gave a height of 3,719 meters. However, the very highest point of the mountain is a short distance along the Knife Edge Summit Ridge. Our GPS measurements were therefore used to calibrate a 3D computer model of the mountain made from aerial photography. We were then able to calculate the height of the highest point of Aoraki Mount Cook, which now stands at 3,724 meters. This is 40 meters lower than the summit height prior to the 1991 rock avalanche. We climb mountains for various reasons, various personal reasons, but it, we also climb and look at our landscapes for understanding our world much better. And I think this contributes to understanding our world.